We are down in Los Alcatraz, which is down on the Mar Menor. We've come to see Alex, that's the company accountant, but they also, or his company, also specialises in other things. And in this video, he's going to talk to us about visa options. And this is a video that you guys have been asking for, so I hope it's useful and I hope you enjoy it. Take notes, check the description. Uh, and we'll put the QR code on that I'll give you a link to as well if need be. Let's go. So this morning we've uh, come to meet up with Alex, who's actually our accountant, but he's also a specialist in visas. And when they were placing the sub exhibition was on last time, he was one of the professionals that was giving advice about applying for visas and the type of visas that that you can that are available. Um, and lots of you have been asking about visas, so we thought we'd come and speak to a specialist because we're not specialists and we don't want to give any misinformation. Now, bear in mind that this can change from the moment in time that we do this video. So the information that we do now I'm... is correct. As of today. Yeah, today is the 24th of April, 2024. Okay, okay. thank you, Helen and Andy, for counting with us. Uh, well, you know me, and we are your accountant for many years. Uh, obviously, I will introduce myself for the people watching the video. My name is Alex Sanchez. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm the director of the company Legal and Tax in Spain, and we have an experience of over 20 years representing individuals and companies in Spain setting up business, buying properties, etc. And obviously for the last few years, organising the visas for them. Yeah. Whereabouts are your offices, Alex? We have offices in Alicante, in Elche, is our main office, near to Alicante Airport, just literally yeah. 10, 15 minutes. We have office now we are in our Los Alcázares office, and we have offices in Malaga as well. Yeah. So. Now, the other thing that uh, Alex's company can do as well, is they can also organise the TIE cards, got mine. Driving licences. Uh, which they've sorted out for a few in the office yeah, as well. So things, things like that. So even if you don't want visas or visa advice, Alex's company can help you with obtaining your TIEs and your driving license, your exchange of your driving license from an English one, for example, to a Spanish one. Or anything legal or official. Or taxes. Or, yeah, taxes. For example, if you buy a property in Spain or yeah. you don't need a visa, you need to organise every year the, the work tax yeah. and you need to present. Basically, and also we have an after sales department where we can help to the people on any problem that may arise after the time of the purchase. Yeah. Now, the other thing to note as well is Alex is independent of us and of the company. We only tend to let you guys know about people and companies that we use ourselves and we're happy with the service. It's not just some randoms off the internet. So, for instance, when I went and got my TIE card, I didn't, I didn't have the appointment just made for me and off I went on my own. One of Alex's company representatives came with me, did the translation and basically held my hand through the whole process. I've been here 10 years and even I wouldn't like to do things just, like that. Yeah, it just makes life a lot easier. I mean, I've been, <coughs> I've been here for a lot longer than 10 years and my level of Spanish is not bad. But when it comes to doing anything official with the authorities, it's always much more comfortable to use a company like Alex's to do it to do it for you. And also it's not just to book the appointment or do the translation, it's to explain what has to be done, the way that has to be yeah. done, the implications many times because yeah. it's not just to go to present a document. No, and stamp. well, red you know tape. You know, Danny to stamp the documents, but. Red tape in Spain is, is not it's, easy. It's yeah. something more than that. Yeah. And now it's obviously one of the main concerns for the people are the visas. 100%. Yeah. And for the visas, we need to take in consideration. I always say to the people, um, the people come to us and they say, I want the digital number, I want the non lucrative, I want this, I want that. And we say, no. Tell me which one is your personal situation. Yes. Because considering the patient personal situation may vary. That means we have clients and they, come, they are coming um, for the digital nomad visa and we found that it's not possible for them or it would be convenient to organize the non-lucrative first and later change. Yeah. So it's extremely important to have an appointment with them. We can organize a Zoom, uh, it would be a free Zoom call to have the personal feedback, the personal situation and then we can put on the table the options and advantages and disadvantages. Every visa has advantages, but also disadvantages. Yeah. 
and we need to take in consideration. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit, it's a minefield. Yes. Yeah. So, what different options of visas have we got? Uh, the main one at the moment is the non-lucrative visa. Yeah. The non-lucrative visa is a visa where you are the most important thing on the non-lucrative visa is that you are not allowed to work. Yeah. So you've well, got to have sufficient funds to support yourself. Yes. Uh, what that, the people many uh, many times ask to us how ta what type of funds? How do I need to prove my funds? I always say the more sugar the sweeter. Yeah. Because it's not only that you have an um, X amount of money as a deposit on your bank accounts. It's maybe you don't have enough on the bank account, but you have pensions every month. Mm -hmm. You have already a property in Spain. So there are a few things that we need to take in consideration that at the time, so give me everything we organize. And what we need to, to do is to present, well, at the time that we present the application, is present to prove that you have enough funds to survive by yourself mm -hmm. in the UK, in Spain. Yeah. The main thing of the, um, the main intention of the visa with the funds is to prove that you will not be sitting on the common. Yeah. That you have enough funds to cover yourself and you will not get any, you will not be asking for benefits in the next six yeah. months. Yeah. Okay. So the digital, the nom digital nomad visa is different. You are allowed to work in Spain, but not for Spanish companies. So uh, we have different uh, straight away, um, we can see straight away the difference between both visa and the main intention of both. Yeah. Going back to the non-lucrative, we can say that the non-lucrative is the simple visa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does the amount that you need, as I understand it, so for year one you need X amount and then for year two you need double? Yes, well, um, at the time that you present the application, uh, the uh, non-lucrative visa is based on what is called the IPREM. IPREM is an index of salaries in Spain. It's not, and on that, that index is used by the government to know if you get access to benefits, to mm -hmm. this or that. How much is the IPREM at the moment in Spain? 7,200 euros. Okay. So for the non-lucrative visa, you need to prove that you have 400% of the IPREM, around 28,000 euros right, okay. for the first applicant. For the second one, it will be 100% of the IPREM. Okay. And onwards. Yeah. So per couple, we say around 37, 35, 37,000 euros into the bank account for the first year. Okay. Why? Because the non lucrative visa, you can apply for it only in your own country and it will be for one year. When you renew the non-lucrative visa, it will be for two years. Yeah. In principle, you should have the double of funds for two years. But if you don't have the double in seat in the bank account, but you have the pension every month, it will be counted right, as okay. money. Yeah. So okay. So if you've so, got a guaranteed income like a pension, they, they, for example, they take that into consideration. Um, some people present um, that they receive dividends, yeah. that they have um, shares yeah. into the stock market. They have, it's not only just pensions. and They can also have a passive income like a rental income, can't they? Yes, yeah. the rental income it will be classified, but the, the government is reluctant to the rental incomes because they may consider than at any point the tenant may leave. Of course, yeah. So it's not something that is permanent. Yeah. But if you have, for example, a private pension, yeah. then you're taking, maybe you are not taking any amount, but you have the funds in place. Yeah. This is what I say, it's important, give me all the information of everything you have, and we will prepare and present on the best way to pass yeah. the application. So. The thing that is uh, the non-lucrative visa we have is for people who want to come to live to Spain. They don't want to work at all in Spain or England. They have uh, the 400% of the IPREM for the first applicant, 100% of the IPREM for the second onwards. That means it's around 35 to 37,000 euros uh, savings. Yeah. Obviously, as I explained, it could be other ways. Yeah. To have the money to prove that you have enough yeah. funds. So is it less if you own a property in Spain already? No, if you own a property in Spain and you don't have mortgage on the property, 
that means that you will have it's not the things are clear at the time that you present the application it's 400 percent of different but if you prove look i have my own house in spain free of mortgage so i have already a house that i don't need to pay rental i don't need to pay so it's more things at the time of the application and it will be considered and it will be counted okay to make it easier to pass the yeah. if you are coming to me with a very short income or very short savings although you have a property in spain it will be very difficult almost impossible mm. it's a mix of everything now the visas just to clarify the matter to chop this around the visas are for people that are coming from third countries so if, for instance, somebody has, somebody's coming from England because of Brexit, uh, now they need a visa, now they can't work. There's people that we've seen still wanting to come to Spain and work, and it's not that straightforward, unfortunately. There is the option where people can actually get an Irish passport and do it that way, and then in that case, the visas aren't required at all, no, are they? Because, and it's just like being in the Yeah, because, ha, because I, Ireland is part of the is part of the EU, so they've got freedom of movement, just like we used to have before Brexit. So if you've got Irish relatives, <laughs> have a look check at it. that route as yeah, well. Yeah, that's, that's probably easier. Now, than there are two things to check it. One, although you're Irish, what do I want to do when I'm coming to Spain? Do I want to be just a holiday maker, or I want to stay in Spain? Uh, as a, with Irish passport, you don't have the restrictions of the 90 yeah. days. Although, by law, you should not stay in Spain more than 183 days. Without becoming a resident. If tax not, resident, yeah. you could become yeah. tax resident in yeah. Spain. And that applies to everybody. And Exactly. Yeah. And second is because if you uh, have the Irish passport, although you don't apply the visa, if you want to come to live to Spain, you apply the residency straight away. Yes, yeah. If someone... Uh, I can apply, we can apply the residencia for the one who has the um, Irish passport and as soon as he or she has the residencia we can apply for the partner under his or her umbrella yes so it could be organized on both ways so if one of the if, if there's a couple that's married and one of them has the Irish passport the other one piggybacks off yes is we apply for the person with the Irish passport first yeah. And later, for the person married to the person the that the person that's married to the person with the Irish or the EU passport, yeah, because it might not be Irish, they might be Italian, it could be anything. yeah, exactly. So the person that's married to the person with the EU passport is that person allowed to work then with the resi with the as soon as you... visa that they get? No, not visa, but... residency. No, they will be allowed okay, to work. So they don't yeah. they just bypass the visa yeah. process altogether. Go straight to oh, okay. the. Be... The other yeah. option is go and find yourself a nice Spaniard and get married. Yeah. Well, get married in England because it's easier to get married in England than it is in Spain. And cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, if you are in British, married to, with someone with the EU passport, when you get the residencia, because when the visa, we apply for the visa for five years. Yeah. After five years, if we want to stay in Spain, well, we need to go to the process of the residencia. Yes, yeah. So you save you jump those five years right, yeah. Yeah. and you go straight to the application of the residencia. Yeah. The residencia, when it comes through, then is it that a residencia with permission to work? Yeah. yeah okay. Because with I've seen I've seen a few residencia cards yes. that they're not with they're not allowed to work. No, but they are a different <laughs> type of residencia. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. That makes it a little bit clearer. Yeah. Like well, yeah. sort of I know that it's a lot of information and too many things. Well, people can, because because we're, because we're doing a video, people can go back and go back okay. and, and look at it over and over again until it. No until problem. it sinks in because it is mind-blowing one thing for you all to know have a look in the description and in there you will see chapters you will see links to alex's company and links to our website t.co.com where there's lots of other bits of information on there also we will put chapters in place so you can jump backwards and forwards in the video to the bits that you need that's yeah. going to be beneficial yeah. to you to watch yeah so you don't have to watch it all again if you don't want to you can just jump to the chapter that's interesting to you Another important issue at the time that we present the application is all the other documents that are needed and you need to present yeah. when you uh, apply yeah. for the visa. Yeah. For example, one is the ACRO, the criminal record for the last five right, years. Okay, yeah. Is this on, regardless of visa type being applied? For? Yes, but it's on the last five years of your residency. Let's say, for instance, that you are British, but you were living for the last five years, you were just last year in the UK, 
the previous four years in the U.S. Yeah. So the way that you need to present the ACRO is for the five years, last five years where you were resident. And also you need to present a medical certificate. It's quite simple. It's not a proper medical check. It's a certificate saying that you can accomplish with the basic health and safety yeah. uh, situation. And the th something to take in consideration on both is both documents expire. Right. Okay. So this is why it's extremely important when we organize the visas we give to the people the time frame. Yes. So it's not, I start the visa, I apply for everything and I do this, no. Because when you get the ACRO, you need to do the health apostar and you need to do the sworn translation. With the medical report, it's exactly the same. The health apostar and the sworn translation. The ACRO is valid for six months. Right, okay. And the medical report, well, it used to be three, has changed now yeah. to six. So that's a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And the medical is valid for three months. Right, okay. That's important because sometimes we realize that mistakes made by people that they come to us with all the documents in place to try to speed it up. Yeah. No, because it's a process and takes the eight weeks or six to eight weeks minimum to organize it. So it's all about what, as we say, is lining, getting all your ducks in a row. Excellent. So on the other, the other side as well, which is also what people are asking about is, if they have a property to sell in the country that they're in, yeah. the Spanish tax year is from January to December. December. Calendar year. Yeah. Calendar year. In other countries, for instance, in England, it's April to April, 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 April yeah. which is nuts. What's the situation and do people need to be aware of things like capital gains tax when they're selling a property in their country of origin that they're leaving to a country if they're coming to Spain? Do they need to bear in mind that they could be liable for capital gains? Um, well, we need to identify the type of visa. For okay. example, for the non-lucrative visa, as soon as you apply for it, you become fiscal resident in Spain. That means I get the non-lucrative visa, I'm resident in Spain, I need to present my tax return in Spain. Mm -hmm. For what? For my worldwide incomes. This is why always, always, because maybe I'm a chartered accountant and I'm focused on taxes, I always say to the people, before we start the visa, you need to give me all the information. Yeah. And later, we organize a tax plan. What means the tax plans? Okay, what do you want to do and when? I'm not saying to the people, sell the house, sell this, sell that. No, 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 no. Do you want to sell your house in the UK? Yes or no? If you want to sell it, we need to organize the way that you sell, or the time that you are selling to avoid that you pay the capital gains tax in Spain. Mm -hmm. If you want to keep the property, we have options that we may organize for the properties. There are people that have more than one property and they are renting. They say that it's their income that they have and they don't want to sell the properties because it's a good income yeah. for them. Yeah. So we can organize before they come to Spain in the UK everything. I'm not qualified, I'm not registered in the UK, so I cannot give advice in the UK. But with the accountant in the UK, we work together yeah. and we organize the tax plan. Yeah. It's very important. For people who want to come to Spain with a digital nomad visa, it's different. With the digital nomad visa, although you are living in Spain, although you work in Spain for international companies, you are classified as a non-resident in Spain. So we have five years for the time that you started, you received the first visa to organize all your tax plan in the UK, depending on what you want to do. Yeah. So they have more time to think about it with the digital nomad. Yes, visa. but yeah. it's not, you should not choose the digital nomad because I have more time to think. No, no. no. It's because I want to come to Spain, I have a company, to work, etc., etc. So there are few requirements that you need to fulfill yeah. to, 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 uh, to go this route. But what I'm saying is different visas, yeah, different. different implications yes. on taxes. Yeah. And I'm guessing there's also implications with the amount, minimum amount of time you've got to spend in Spain. So for instance, you can't go out of Spain for six months on your jollies. And on both, on all the visas, the intention, well, it used to be different with the golden visa. We will have a few words after that, uh, for, about that later. But for the digital NOMA and the non-lucrative visa on both, you should stay in Spain more than six months of the yes, year. Yeah. Why? Because you are living in Spain and you are permanent in Spain. 
we need to take in consideration with the digital nomad, maybe for business reasons or for work reasons, you stay more than six months out of the country because you need to travel for business. Yeah. Because you are working for an international company. Something that you need to take in consideration by then, and we, this is the way that we use, is if the family hub is in Spain, you suppose your husband is in Spain, children go to school in Spain, you can prove that you have regular expenses in Spain. Yeah. Although you are traveling often, you could be applied for the, you could be um, on the digital nomad visa. My only concern on both is today, when you apply for the residencia five years later, you should have maximum 10 months out of Spain over the five years. Okay. So in one way, every year you can stay longer. On the non-lucrative visa, you can stay maximum six months out of the country. On the digital nomad, it should be the same, but because of work, may happen that you stay a little bit longer. We have clients, for example, they work on the oil rings in yeah. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So they stay seven, eight months abroad, yeah. but they're residents in Spain yeah. and they pay taxes in Spain. For these people with the digital nomad visa, what they have is a in and out, but we consider the family have as a proof of residency yes. in Spain. Yeah. The most important, something that I want to put the emphasis is on the non-lucrative visa is the tax plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't go or don't start the process if you are not 120% clear about what you are doing. Because bear in mind and also the first year, as you explained, and the taxes are different. You are coming from April to April. Now you start in January to December. Some people say, okay, if I'm selling the house and I move to Spain after July, I will stay in Spain less than six months. So I will not be considered as a fiscal resident in Spain. I don't like that rule. Uh, also, the people need to understand that one thing is when they buy the house, if they can buy the house tomorrow. One thing is the purchase of the house. And another thing is the visa application. Yeah. They can buy the house as a non-residence. They can start to use the house with the 90 days restrictions. We have the time to organize everything. And by the end of this year or next year, we present the application. So the taxes is, for me, the key point on this month. They have to present the application while they're in the UK, though, don't they? Or while they're in their own country? The non-lucrative visa, the only option that you have is you need to go to your on your own country yeah. or, or where you are resident. Yeah. Because if you are British and you are resident in America, yeah. you can go to the consulate in America and you will apply for for it on the Spanish consulate. Yeah. It's for one year, after the renewal, it's for two years, and after for two more years. Uh, something that also is you need to present is a private medical insurance, mm -hmm. or S1, if you are retired, and you can register the S1 for the medical assistance in yeah. Spain. On the subject of the medical insurance, if anybody's wanting that, actually one of our subscribers can arrange that, so just find us, Drop us a contact and we'll pass your details on to give you a quote. If they're coming from the UK and they're retired, they can get the S1, so there's still some sort of reciprocal yes. agreement there the, with, yes. the, with yeah. the medical cover. You register the S1 into yeah. the Social Security in Spain, it would be an email, it's a process. Yeah. But uh, with the S1, you can use the Spanish um, public or state hospitals. Yes. Yeah. I want to say to the people, many people are concerned about the state hospitals in Spain. And I would like to say that they are excellent. I, I would like to say 100%. I'm really sad to say, actually, because I think the UK used to have one of the best national health services in the world a few years ago. But I don't agree with that anymore. And I 100% now think that the Spanish health service is fantastic. And through no fault of the nurses and the doctors in the UK, it surpasses the, the NHS. Because Me. the waiting times are less. The The... Here in Spain, the health service seems to have um, have more of a prevention rather than cure sort of motto. So you, you get you get checked out a lot easier and and treatments fantastic, fantastic. So don't anybody worry about using the the national health system here in Spain because it is phenomenal. I've had quite a bit of treatment on it myself. 
And for example, even myself, I have a private medical insurance because I travel a lot. Yeah. But when something happens, if I twist my ankle, okay, I use the private medical. But if something serious, I go to the yeah. public hospital. And, and you never seem to have to wait for a long time for a doctor's appointment? Or... Well, it's, you need to wait. But... Not compared to UK. Well, but, yeah. exactly. <laughs> this is in relation to all visas and it's regarding families. So if you come over on a visa, your visa application is successful. And you go down the line and you have kids in school. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's oh, yeah, state this, school yeah. or whether private. private school. I don't know if there's an option for either or. When the kids come of age, whereby they're of age where they can start to work, but they're piggybacking on their parents' visa, how does that happen? What Does that mean that they can't work, they can't get jobs? or uh, When they are on the first five years... It should be the same type of visa there where they are not allowed yeah. to work. Yeah. Uh, it's true on the non lucrative visa, after one year, you can change it into a working visa. Okay. So let's say, for instance, your son, after two years, three years, he wants to start to work. The problem is to change into a working visa, the non lucrative visa, what you have to have is a Spanish company to support yourself. That means must give you a job offer full time and must be presented that way. Is that straightforward and easy? No. But may organize a working visa from the non lucrative, but if it's not your children, it's you. You're coming to Spain, you are a pensionist, you are still young, you say, in three years' time, I want to do something, I want to work, or I want to start a business we can consider what is called the entrepreneur visa and it's linked to a business plan that you need to present the type of business that you want to start, how many employees you will have, the investment that you will make, etc, etc. So it could be another visa that you can change. Many people, when they come to Spain, at the beginning they say, okay, I want to have one, two years, Relax. calm down, yeah. I don't want to work, I want to do nothing. Let's go straight for the digital, no, for the non-lucrative, sorry, because I have enough funds. Mm. And let's see what happens in the next two, three years. By then, we may consider. Also, personal opinion, I think that the relationship European Union, United Kingdom is improving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you are fully aware of the problems that we have with the driving licenses. Yes, yeah. And by then, when the new Prime Minister arrives to the... In the United Kingdom, they went to see uh, Macron in France, and in one, two days, they resolved all the problems yes, for the driving yeah. license. So I think it would be easier. What may happen, so it would be any other option in one year, two years? We don't know. Well, possibly this video will be completely uh, uh, not needed in what, like, so, so, because, well, yeah. I hope so, that yeah. it will not be needed the visa anymore, and the people may come to Spain, as they used to be. Yeah. And they come on their, uh, on their own country yeah. straight away. Yeah. Bear in mind that after five years, you cannot be on the visa anymore. So there will be residence. So that they, it they will can... be residencia. And with the residencia, you are allowed to work. Right. Okay. okay. So that basically, crux of it is, you move over here with your family, your family can't really, worst case scenario, you can't do anything for five years. In five years' time, he will become, we will apply for the residencia. And it would be necessary to organize the residencia. Uh, they give to them the permission to work in Spain. Yeah. Or if they, if your son is not ten, is seventeen, and two years later he wants to start to work, we may change into a working visa with the um, job offer that he or she has received from a US Spanish company. Yeah. Must be a full-time contract. In this company really wants you yeah they really yeah they really want you or they really need you involved in the business the thing with the visa something that you need to understand are not black or white as most of the things in spain yeah things are not when the people come to me and say many times i answer it depends so we need to see and we need to take in consideration the options uh maybe your son he wants to study or keep studying we can extend into a student visa mm -hmm. it's different with different implications good to know yeah good so 
Is there anything else to say about non-lucrative visa? Or For the non-lucrative visa, is my main concern is the tax plan. Yeah, so it, it needs to be pre-planned. That's the most important thing. At the, at the very beginning, before we start to do anything, we have to have an appointment or a Zoom or whatever to check which one is your personal situation to find out the best route for you. Yeah. Because bear in mind that the tax office in Spain they have five years to knock the door and say yeah. hello. My name is tax office. Yeah. Uh, give me. <laughs> Let me have your name. Exactly. Yes. So we don't want that. Yeah. And we want to organize. Uh, for the digital nomad, it's different. For example, if you want to come to work to Spain, or your son, for example, um, need um, want to work, we have the digital nomad. This visa is basically to bring talent to Spain. Yeah. To bring people from abroad, work living in Spain, but working for companies out of the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, here there are some differences. For example, when you present the application, you have to have at least three months. It will be one company that's giving yeah. to you the support to come to Spain. This company must accept a uh, should be a letter writing by them then they give you the permission to come to Spain to work. So is that all that you need from the company? Just no, like a... no, no thing. Right, okay. Again, not that simple, unfortunately. <laughs> you have to have at least one year working on this company yeah. or a university degree, because also you need to prove that you have the experience. With a university degree, it's almost straightforward. If not, to prove that you are working for that company in that particular job for at least one year. Yeah. The requirements on incomes is different, because here we are not based on the E-Prem. We are based on the minimum salary in Spain. Yeah. The minimum salary by law is 1,300 euros per month. So you have to have... Gross? Gross, gross yeah. Gross. You have to have at least 200% of the minimum salary and as the minimum income to, to present the application. Yeah. This is for the main applicant. Yeah. For the uh, husband and spouse, it's 100%, 75%. And 25% onwards for the following. Right, okay. So if we are saying uh, for one family, one couple uh, with one children, it will be around 3,600, 3,900 euros. Euros. We are always talking in yes, euros, course, sorry. Yeah. We didn't mention before. Yeah. Per month. Yeah. The, the digital nomad also have... It could be that you could be an employee of one company, that the company gives you the support, mm -hmm. or you are a self-employed. Right, okay. If you are a self-employed, you have to have contract with your clients that are out of the European Union yeah. for at least one more year yeah. at the time that you present the application. It, depending if we are talking about the digital nomad on employee or self-employed, there are different requirements, different things, but... We will discuss at the time, considering the personal situation yes, of, course, of each. Yeah. The main difference with the non-lucrative is the type of incomes. Here is based on the minimum salary. Yeah. On the non-lucrative, we were talking about the EPREM. So on the on the digital nomad, you don't need to have the savings available. No, it's the, it's, it's the income, the, the income yeah. that you've got. And the most important thing with the digital nomad is you are appointed as a non-resident. Yeah. If you are the digital nomad, yeah. is very good for all those who has a very high level of income. Yeah. Because you have a flat rate of 24% on personal income tax up to 600,000 euros. So if you're on, if you cut me direct to sort of status, there are big tax benefits from doing this. Yes, extremely high. So also we consider, or we have again, the tax plan with the client because depending on the type of visa we can consider more salaries or dividends depending on the route and the taxes to minimize the tax level yeah. in or the tax in Spain. Just a quick question then about digital nomad visas because the type of person that's moving over with a digital nomad might be a little bit younger than yes. the person that's looking for a non-lucrative visa. They might have children that are of school age. Yeah. Now, if you come over on a non-lucrative visa, you're a resident in Spain straight away. Yes. So you can get your children into a Spanish school if, you're at, if you have children. On a digital nomad visa, because you're not a resident, can you get your children into state school? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You are resident. It's a peculiar situation. You are living in Spain, 
appointed as a non-resident for taxes. Right, okay. That means that you will pay your taxes as a non-resident. Yeah. You don't need to present the Form 720. Yeah. The Form 720 is when you are resident in Spain, you need to identify all your assets abroad. Bank accounts, shares or properties for more than 50,000 euros. Yeah. That is something as a digital nomad because you are non-resident, you don't need to present that. Yeah. And you present the taxes in Spain only for the income that you have on the salaries or self-employed business, not any other income yes, that you may have. I understand. So the, the, the employment that you've moved over with, yes. that's, what you're, that's what you're declaring. Exactly. Yeah. So, and the children, because you live in Spain, they are entitled to go to school. Right, okay. If you're on the digital nomad visa and your partner's here, are they able to work? At the beginning, I would say no. Okay. But it's something that... I think it would change soon. That's why they've got to prove that their their income is enough yeah, to for support them. them, the spouse, and whatever children they've got. And obviously, you need to plan, plan, and plan, and then get advice. Yeah, uh, not advice off people on the internet that's been talking to the guy down the pub whose name's George. Yeah, we see a lot of people put just put questions on Facebook groups asking these really important questions, and. Rather than asking a specialist, ask. We are a firm. We are. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm a member of the, of the Chartered Accountant Society. We have solicitors in house, members of the law society. So you are talking to pro with professionals yeah. exactly, exactly the same yeah. that you are doing when you go to a solicitor. And like Alex said, if if it's your initial um, contact, there would be a, a free Zoom call available to discuss things and then move on from that point. We organise for uh, the clients. That is coming to you every uh, single Zoom call, a free Zoom call, yeah. sorry, to uh, discuss which one is what they want to do, the best rule, etc. etc. Because as I said at the beginning, things may vary. For example, the question uh, if the spouse or the husband want to work in Spain, maybe at the time of the digital nomad visa, it would be necessary or it would be better if we apply for two, both of them. The digital nomad. Yeah. Can you apply for a digital nomad for one and a non-lucrative for the other, or, or would it? Be... We we don't usually do that no. way purely for one reason because if no, you have to have a high income. Right. Okay. Bear in mind that the main applicant is on the digital nomad yeah. is two hundred percent of the yeah. minimum salary, and the main applicant on the non-lucrative visa is four hundred percent of yeah. the IPRE. Yeah. So if you are the main one on both, you need to get almost yeah. double yeah. of the proof of incomes. Yeah. So I would recommend as a family to do together yeah. because it's the way to prove with the lowest or the lower level. Do the people have to actually be married? Uh, or civil partnership. Right, okay. On the digital nomad, it would be necessary also to present exactly the same that we mentioned before with the acro criminal records, the medical certificate, the private medical insurance. Yeah. Here, for the private on the digital nomad, you cannot present the S1. No, because you're working. Exactly, yeah, so you're you, working. Yeah. So uh, it's something that must be done with the private medical insurance. And extremely important for the non-lucrative visa that now we don't have anymore, the golden visa, than it was for big investors or people buying properties for over half a million euros. The non-lucrative visa is become the new visa for all those who want to spend more in Spain. Yeah. Because they usually when the people spend more, means that they have high incomes. If you have high income, you have a 24% flat. So it's something to take in consideration. Yeah, so just very quickly about the golden visa. The golden visa was, uh, we, to be honest, we are lost. Yeah. We don't really know we, where we are. Uh, it was a couple of 10 days ago, the Prime Minister said that the Golden Visa will be cancelled. There's always been a little bit of controversy about it though, and they've always said that, I've, I've heard before that they've said that they were thinking about cancelling the Golden Visa. And... Uh, it depends on the political party. Yeah. It depends who is in power, yeah. they say one thing or the other. Yeah. The Golden Visa it was, a, from my personal opinion, it was a good option because people coming to Spain with big investments, obviously they will spend big amount of money in Spain, they go out, they have other things on top of buying purely the property. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, is it still valid? I have not seen the law that it has been cancelled. So if we don't have the document saying that the law has been cancelled, 
the law is still valid. But if you're, if you're thinking about applying for the golden visa, it could be that you start your application and then before the application's processed, this visa's been cancelled. So Can, That may happen. Yeah. And the other thing to note about the golden visa is, yeah, you've got to be invested in a property worth 500,000 euros or more, but that is one person yes you can't with be no buying, mortgage you can't be buying in two names no. because that means you're only making an investment to 250,000 euros each and then you're not eligible for a golden visa it's with have me with no mortgage no mortgage so it's a pure investment of it could be 800,000 the property with yeah. 300,000 mortgage yeah. but half a million must be clear yeah the golden visa does that does that just give they can become a, a resident straight away or the, the golden visa you don't have the restrictions of the 90 days yeah and you choose if you want to be resident or non-resident right, okay stay. it's your choice if you yeah. stay more than half of the year or less yeah. of half of the year but we don't know what will happen no the visa the most important visa at the moment are the are the digital nomad and the non-lucrative yeah. there are others like the entrepreneur the working visa but we need to take in consideration the personal situation. Yeah. I was going to say thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Alex, for your time. Don't forget, if you want any more information, look in the description and we'll give you Alex's company's details. Or if you go to the website, there'll be a contact form on there specifically where we can put you in touch with Alex. And then there's all the other information and links to the other uh, work videos because we don't tend to do work videos on here yeah but we you've been asking us to do these videos so we are doing them because that's what you've asked us to do leave us a comment if you've got any questions that you put in the comments we'll put them forward and try and reply in the comments if we can but ideally contact us and that's the yeah best because way. if you've got specific questions that we've not answered um if you send us the questions but we need your contact details so that we can actually pass it on to alex and he can answer the questions for you I hope well, Danny has been uh, useful and answered some of, the, if not all, some of the questions. I'm too. sure, I'm sure it has been, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Alex. So, okay, then. So, thanks a lot, Alex. We'll thank you, Alex. Soon.